um, continue with uh, what we began some, some weeks ago, uh, called to serve him, called to serve him, talking about called to serve Jesus, called to serve our God. This is actually the third, um, third what, session of, of, of teaching this, began so some weeks ago, some last Sunday, but oh, three Sundays ago actually. So you can go to, uh, you know, different uh, social platforms, me- media, uh, podcast, whatever it is, then you can get these messages and be able to follow. But in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verse 15 and 18, that has been our text, it says, Therefore I also, Apostle Paul writing by the Spirit of God to the church, says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. I'll stop there. It continues, and we shall continue next week. But that you may know what is the hope of his calling. It talks about the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and it says that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Church, we need this. For, for you and I to be successful in our lives, we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Nothing else will give us true contentment and fulfillment. And actually, the thing is this, the true contentment and fulfillment in the lives of a person comes as a result of their obedience to God. Now, I'm not talking to non-believers, but if anyone who's not born again today, the first step of obedience is first by acknowledging Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I'm speaking to those who are born again also. That the first thing is this, uh, I mean, the the thing about you and I, to live a fulfilled life, we have to follow the Lord. We must know what he's called us to do, and we must do what he's told us to do for the fulfillment of our lives. That removes every kind of fear. That removes every kind of uncertainty. That removes any kind of, I don't know what to do. Listen, God is a God of purpose. He has placed inside of you a call for you to fulfill. You have an assignment on this earth. You have an assignment for your generation. Now, when I say that, I think of the the ones who are given talents, some five. One was given five, one was given uh, two, and the other one was given one. But look at this, maybe one talent, but what are you going to use it for? Are you going to obey God and use it for his glory? It may be two talents, maybe five, maybe ten. But the thing is this, at the end of your life, at the end of our lives here on this earth, God will require from us and ask us, what did we do with what he gave to us? Okay? Or at least when you say yes, that's fine. I know you're here. I know you didn't leave after praise and worship. So last week, I I talked about the types and shadows, and and types and shadows for someone who's here for for the first time, talking about the children of Israel in relation, looking at the children of Israel, how God dealt with the children of Israel in relation to our salvation, or we can call it our redemption. So it's a type of redemption, and the first thing I said that God uh, spoke to, 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 to Moses and told him, tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they may serve him, so that they may serve me. Let my people go so that they may serve me. So this is what you see. Our salvation, that was a type of salvation, our salvation, why we have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness, as the Bible says, we've been brought into the kingdom of God as born-again believers, is that we may serve God. This is our assignment, that you may serve God. So we need to know that. And then another thing that I said, um, what what they were supposed to do, is they were supposed to have no other God but God. The Lord our God. And then thirdly I say, they are going to have to be total submitted to him 
He is our Lord. Him alone. No other God. They're not supposed to have any other God but the Lord Jehovah, the Lord their God. Let me see if I can go back over here to my one God. Like what you had us singing, all other gods are the works of men. But there is only one true God. And they are supposed to serve him and him alone. Listen to what he says in the scriptures here that we read last week, but I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize on this point of total submission to him. He's our Lord, among the things that I said last week, because we are living in a self-centered world. And as children of God, we must, be, we must refuse to be cultured by it. Self-centered. Everything is self, 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 self. Amazing is this, amazing thing is this, even the things that are done in the name of benevolence, some of the things is just for this, the person. An example, if I helped you, I have to put it on the media to say that I helped this man, I found him in the streets, and, uh, and uh, I helped him. So what does it mean? You have all the likes on Facebook, and those are your rewards. You remember what I said? Those are your rewards. Because you did it for men to see you. But if we are truly serving God and we are truly doing whatever we are doing, we are doing it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God sees. God recognizes. God answers. So the children of Israel had to, to, be, to, to, to have only one God. And this in our generation, church, it will take you great commitment to the Lord and his call on your life to not be conformed to the world. That will take great commitment. Let me say something here. That the, the world and its system actually is crying out for your attention all the time. All the time. More than any generation, we have distractions than any generation before us. So much distraction. It's amazing. You can send a text anywhere in the world, so to speak. But there are some places they have no network. But you understand what I mean. But it's amazing of communication, how it has become. Now, if, if, if we don't use that and we don't, we don't pursue God and, and be wise, that can be such a distraction and we never get to do anything. There are people who cannot live without a phone, even for one hour. Thank you for your enthusiasm, but it's the truth. They have to stay with their phone constantly. Uh, it's amazing. You, you, you sit down with people, and, and, and for me, and it, 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 something irritating is to be in a meeting, and you are focused and talking to the person, and they are looking at their phones. I'll tell you, I'll correct you if I was in that meeting. Because, because I've put mine away so that I can pay attention to you. Why should you be looking at your phone? Thank you again for your enthusiasm, but it's the truth. Look at this in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. About uh, that, that, that the world is craving for your attention. Look, look at this, but we have a higher calling. We have a higher life. It says this, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ is a throne at the place of all power, honor, and authority. And you know that in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, we have been raised together with him. We have been made to sit together with him. And then he says this in verse, verse 2, Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm, and fill your thoughts with the heavenly thought realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Did you see that? The distractions of the natural realm. The natural realm is distracting. It's very distracting. And, and, and I said this, I think when I was speaking about eyes to see, is the natural realm is blinding, uh, blinds a person from the realities of the spiritual realm. God is alive. The spirit realm is more real than the natural realm that we exist here, we are, we are looking at today. The angels in this place working. The things taking place right in here because he sent his word and he healed them 
and deliver them from their distractions. You are being healed right now because of the power that is in the word of God. But do you know what the devil or and what the world system wants to, us to do? Is to focus on the natural. But God says this in verse 3. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. Praise God. I like that. And now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ. This is a walk of faith. Again, I say that the world wants you and I to be cultured by it. A way of thinking that is contrary to the word of God. And in Rom Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it's lengthy, but let me read it a little bit. It's a Bible, okay? Look at this in verse 1 and 2. Uh, from uh, the message translation is so good. So here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You are sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Everything you do. This is what it says. Everything you do, take, give it to God as an offering. That is transformation right there, church. Everything you do, you give unto uh, 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 the Lord as, a, as an offering. And then he says this, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. I think I don't have even to explain anything there. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you, feel you fit into it without even thinking. That is actually being conformed to this world. You fit in the culture without even thinking. This is what we do in our, in, our, in our community. This is what we do in our family. Who taught you that? You've ever heard of a story of a, you know, a pan that was being used from generation to generation by this woman? Let me see if I remember it well. But there's a, a, the grandmother of this girl, of this daughter, uh, didn't have enough, I'll use this so in a way that you can understand it, didn't have enough pan to prepare a certain meal. So actually, so what it means then, when she's preparing, she has to cut it in two pieces for it to fit in that pan. So that happened in that family because they were, they, they were in need. The next one, whose the daughter was born there, uh, also when she got married, she started doing the same thing. That she had to cut whatever she was preparing to fit in that pan. She had to cut it in two pieces, even when the pan was big. The other one, the grandchild was married and was doing the same thing. But this husband was wise to ask, why do you have to cut it in pieces and yet the pan is enough uh, to fit, to fit uh, whatever you're preparing. The, 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 the wife said, I don't know. My mother, that's the way I saw my mother doing. So the mother, she went to the mother and asked the mother, Mother, why do you do what you've been doing in preparing such and such a dish? And the, the mother said, by the way, I don't know. Let's go ask your grandmother. And the grandmother, when they went to the grandmother, the grandma laughed and laughed. And she said, you know what? When I was, I was preparing this, I didn't have a big pan to fit all what this dish I would prepare. So I had to cut it in two pieces. So then, without thinking, they got into the tradition, the culture. Can I ask you a question? Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? The answer for you and I should be this. I do what I do. I do what I do and I do it how I do it because the word of God says so. That's a culture right there. That's the kingdom culture. Because this is the culture of the kingdom. I do because the word of God says so. If you ask, why are you doing what, I'm, what you're doing? It's because the word of God says so. We've been born again. We've been born into the kingdom of God to be not conformed to the culture of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that you may have a kingdom of God thinking. Thank you, Martin. Now, and look at this. Then he says this. Uh, uh, instead of being cultured, instead fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Say, change from the inside out. That should be you and I. We are changed 
from the inside out. We are the inside out people. Change from within. And look at this then. Uh, readily recognize that what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. And like the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Yours and my focus, church, should be to be changed inside out. To be changed inside out. That should be our pursuit in life, to be changed inside out. What is that going to take? The word of God. The word of God. The word of God on a daily basis, that is what is going to change us. Nothing else will work. Um, people can try to do it, uh, you know, they, they can try, try it for some time and discipline themselves for some time. But, you know, without really being changed from inside out, they fall back into those, those things that they are left out to do. But anyway, even that, at the end of your life, you can do all these things outside here, but you've never accepted that change from inside of you, you will not fulfill God's will for your life. You now offer your life for him alone. Your heart must be for him and him alone. Let's go back to these scriptures I'll, we read last week, but I'll do so quickly. Next one, 20, 20 verse 3 says, you, have, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. God was separating his people just for him. And then Deuteronomy 4, 39 says this, Therefore know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord God, the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath there is no other. I don't care how much the world says there are many ways to God. There are no many ways to God. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There's no other, there, there's no many ways to go. He is the way. He said that. I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And there is one God. There's one God. And the way to worship him is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, is the mediator between God and man. The Bible says that. There's only one God. Oh yeah, you Christians just think that there is only one God. Yes, the, the, there is, the only way is through Jesus. He said it, we don't think. We agree with him. We agree with the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then in Deuteronomy 6, 14 says, Deuteronomy 4, 39, uh, 6, 14, sorry. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. God was separating his people from the, the gods with a small g of other nations. And God has called us, remember the Bible says, he's called us out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. He's called us so that we may serve him and him alone. No other God. No other God. That's being fulfilled. That's living a fulfilled life, people. Let, let's read some scriptures we did last week and emphasize some things. In Matthew 6.24, it says this, no one, now, we saw the type in the old covenant, but let's look at the new covenant, what, what Jesus will say, he said this, and no one, say no one. No one. That's what it means. No one. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And look at this, what the Amplifier says there. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. And then he says this, is a money, possessions, fame, status, not, not WhatsApp status, you understand? <laughs> status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. That's very important there. Whatever is valued more than the Lord. I'll say this. Whatever is valued or whatever has value in your life more than the Lord is a God by itself. It's an idol. It's an idol. If money...
has taken the place of God in yours and my life is an idol. If possessions and status and fame has, has they all have taken place uh, a, a higher place than God in our lives, those are idols. And God is a jealous God. He says no one. So we don't even try, don't even attempt. He says no one can serve two masters. No one can serve me and serve possessions. Okay, am I saying that, that then well, we don't need to have any kind of possessions? No, that's another ditch of religion. That's not the kingdom of God. God has promised his people that he shall bless them. But in all, in fact, in fact, he says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, that you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power, ability, vigor to get wealth. So I'm not talking about religious thinking, that, you know, we need to be poor and poor and poor and poor. You, you can't do much with that. You can start there, but you can't do much with that in, in serving the Lord. Why? It takes money for the gospel to go wherever it goes. We know that. It takes money to have a good house, to have food in your table. You know that. Being hungry is not the will of God. You know, being hungry and you don't have anything to eat. It doesn't excite God. That's why Jesus demonstrated by feeding people. And God has promised his people to bless them. So that's not the point. You understand? But I'm talking about the possessions, possessions and status and fame taking the place of God. That means an individual doing that, they are serving that. They are serving status. They are serving fame. They are serving possessions. I like all the time that I can have money in my, in, in my, or anything that when the Lord says, can you take this and give it to so-and-so? I don't have to debate about it. Why? I'm allowing my heart to be circumcised that my attitude should be for the things of the kingdom and helping. If you what you have, if what I have cannot be given to God when he asks for it, then it's become an idol. Abraham had only that son at 100 years old. But when God asked for him, he says, I'm doing exactly that, sir. Why? His son never became an idol. Because he knew God had, had told him, you give me, uh, he knew that God had told him, through your son, all the descendants of the earth shall be blessed. So he knew God was able even to raise that son from the dead. I'm preaching good than you're answering. And you're saying amen. You see what I'm saying? If anything in yours and my life has taken that place of, 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 of God, this possession, that, look at this, if what I have, when God asks for it, I cannot give it to someone, then it's become an idol. It's become between me and God. I should be open when he speaks to me, I can give it. Okay. Those are the times that the church keeps so quiet. But it's all of us. We're talking about serving God. Because if you're not careful, we're just singing the songs. Serving you is my delight. And then, uh, would, you, would you give that 2,000 shillings for that brother over there? Serving you is my delight. Would you give that 2,000 shillings to that brother? Serving you is my... You know, the voice is lifted up because you don't want to give that. You don't want to obey God. Uh, look at this then. The word here is, the word used here is mammon, which is money personified as God and worshipped. Are we seeing that in our community? That never before, and every one of us who are who's of age will say this. This is true. Right now in our nation, the unnatural deaths we are seeing, the kidnapping we are seeing, murders that we are seeing, uh, and, and what, what else? The, the, the corruption. People killing each other. 
I'm about to turn 50, and I've been here for 48 years. I know even my parents, my grandparents, they say this, we've never seen this. Do you agree, anyone who's mature? Do you agree? It's never been this way. It's never been this way. If you go to, you look at it clearly, it goes down to this thing, the love of money is the root of all evil. A society devoid of God will murder, will kill babies, will do everything to rebel against God. That's a society devoid of God. That's why we're seeing what you're seeing. I actually think in these terms, church, if I didn't know Jesus Christ and I didn't have revelation knowledge working in my life, I don't know how I could have lived in this nation. It's not a bad confession. We, we pray for this nation. But it's the world. That's the way the world is, is, is been going. It's not a bad confession. But I'm telling you, it's a horrible place in many, 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 in many circumstances to live in. But God... But faith in God, but angels at work, but the blood of the Lamb, but faith in God that I refuse to fear. You see what I'm saying? So look at this. When, when, when you think about all this, this unnatural death, kidnapping, you really, we are seeing the love of money. Can I say something? Why would anyone still from money, uh, from, from the government or from an institution, money which is supposed to go to, to help the needy and to help the poor and, and, and to help, you know, build a hospital. People are dying and him or her, they have a big stomach and a big house just for their home, for, for, for their, them and their children. That's the love of money. What, what is that? That's being selfish. I become a preacher now. Okay. Let me teach. Let me go back. Teach. But, but do you see my point? In Luke 16, 13, so that's why such, such a thing in your heart has to be settled. You will serve God and Him alone. That has to be settled in your heart. That nothing else, no one else will take this place. I will serve God. And that's why I encourage people, believers in Christ, tithing has a way of circumcising your heart. It's a deep work of the spirit. Listen, it's not so much about money, it's the condition of your heart that God comes in there. That you may acknowledge him, he's the one who gives you the ability to receive what you're receiving. And it's only 10% that he has from us. In Luke 16, 13 says this, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand devotedly by the one. Devotedly by the one. No wonder we hear of morning devotion. Before you do anything, you go to the word of God, that morning devotion. And despise the other. You cannot serve both God, God and Mammon. That is, listen to what he says here, Mammon, is this. Your earthly possessions or anything else you trust in and rely on instead of God. Instead of God. Let me, let me bring a point here. Home. Don't you think if I rely on my rich uncle, then I rely on God? Don't you know that he's become a God? Oh, that's not popular. But that's true. If I'm going to rely on him, as I, uh, the, the, my trust was supposed to be entirely on God and devoted to God, but I'm relying on that rich, uh, uh, rich uncle to do everything for me as if he's God. Don't you know that he can become a God? Okay, thank you. In Mark chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, about the parable of the sower, he says this, which is the one that did not bear any fruit. He says this, Others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but worldly cares. And this is another one, a church here. The seductiveness of wealth. The seductiveness 
of wealth. And the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it produces nothing. In other words, the word has no first place in that heart. The seductiveness of wealth. That we have to think in those terms, church. I'm not preaching against wealth, you know that. I'm not at all. I'm not at all. But I'm, I'm talking about the attitude that we should have in serving God and our attitudes, our attitude, the right goalie attitude towards possessions. The people will do anything for possessions. Anything, including murder, for possessions. What I want to emphasize here is your undivided attention. Talking about serving, you have won. Undivided attention. The world is not going to make it conducive or comfortable for you to serve God. I, I, that I submit to you. It's not going to make it easier for you and me to serve God. In our journey, it is not going to be easy. But I've got good news for you. Many believers in the past generations have stood for God no matter what the world wanted to dictate to them. Shadrach, Abednego, and Meshach, and all the others in their generation, there are many that stood for God. No matter what the world wanted to dictate to them, they chose him alone. They chose him alone and say, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to serve God. I remember when I gave my life to Christ in 1996, uh, and in a certain family that I knew, uh, they looked very good doing in the standard where, of where they're living. They looked very well and all that. So then I went back. Uh, they had a shop, and I, they asked me, the wife, the woman asked me, uh, so what are you doing? I said, I'm preaching the gospel. I said, what? I'm preaching the gospel. I got born again and I'm preaching Jesus. They said, what? Why would you go to school and do that? You need to work and then when you retire, you can preach. Who gave you a guarantee of retirement? How many people are dying that early? I mean, every day. Who told you that? Anyway, and there were people in that shop, that woman really mocked me. She literally did that. And I said, that's fine. And then she asked me this, what will you eat? This is what it means. Serving God to her is poverty. Is living a poor life. A big lie from the kingdom of darkness. Not so. And, unfortunately, that wasn't my prayer and anyone's desire. Everything they had, literally, the wealth they thought they had just shrunk completely from them. I remember years later, maybe it should have been 15 years later, uh, helping the husband. They had even no basic needs. And yet they thought that preaching the gospel is being poor. Serving God is, being, is being, becoming poor. Not so. That's a lie of the kingdom of darkness. It has nothing to do with God. God wants you well. God's, God wants you well. God wants you rich. God wants you blessed. Your children ra being raised up in the fear of God and knowing him and serving him. Amen? Amen. All right? Listen to what I've said about, write what I've said there about the, 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 the believers in the past generations who stood for God no matter what the world wanted to dictate to them. They chose him alone. In Matthew 5, 10, 12. Matthew 10, Matthew 5, uh, verse 10 to 12. Let me read it from the New King James Version. Listen to this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Uh, revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Listen to what it is. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. That's a place to rejoice right there. If you're persecuted for Christ's sake, rejoice. 
and be glad. Why is this? For so they persecuted uh, the, the prophets who are before us. So it's nothing new. And this is my point here. The world is not going to make it easier or more uh, place being conducive for, for us to, pray, to, 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 to serve the Lord. It's going to be harder and harder. But listen to this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But listen to this. You have the faith of God living inside of you. And you are, the Bible says, before anything else, anything else that will ever come to this earth, you are an overcomer. More than a conqueror. I remember, probably you've heard me say this testimony, but I remember I think that was the year 2000. I was walking in town, and, and the Lord used just this scripture to speak to me. Um, I was walking in town, and there was a, a woman. Um, she was well-dressed, and just looking, you know, just decent woman. Um, but on Mamangina Street, daytime, 10.30, I think 10.30, between 10.30 and 11, she was smoking a cigarette. And those are the times that years ago in our nation here, we could barely see women smoking. Nowadays, it's like smoking is going out of fashion. This smoke, I hope I'm not saying anything about you here. You are delivered. <laughs> but she was smoking, actually. And then... Uh, and then the Lord said this, uh, and people are looking at her. The Lord said this, uh, go tell her about my love. Mm -mm. No. I, I, really, the answer in my heart was no. And, I say, and he said again, go tell her about my love. She's walking, remember, Mamangina Street, opposite New, in, in, I think, International House, International what? Life house. She's walking over, and people are looking at her. And then for me to walk with her, I was behaving like a Pharisee. But he said this, go tell her about my love. And then I said this, Lord, suppose she starts causing all chaos here. And then he said this, blessed uh, for those who are persecuted for my name's sake, or for my sake. I said, God. And then immediately he said this, uh, pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Spirit. He who prays in tongues edifies himself. So I started praying in tongues. Right? And I'm following her. I'm coming behind her. And then I got close. I said, excuse me. And she looked at me and said, yes. I said, I have good news for you. Jesus is the way, life. And then she says this, and the truth. She literally did that. I'm telling you the truth. If I was speaking King James Version, I'll say verily, verily. That's the truth. She said, and, 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 and the truth and all and life. And then I said, um, I, I, I want to pray. I want you to pray this prayer so that you may, you, you may receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please pray with me? I didn't preach or anything. I told her that. And she said, yes. And then I said, please repeat this prayer after me. She said, Lord Jesus, I didn't close my eyes. Now, when you're praying with people down the street, just don't close your eyes tightly. <laughs> That's word of knowledge there and wisdom. Don't, I mean, don't go closing your eyes and shutting your eyes and you can't even see around. Don't do that in the streets. It's happened to me several times and I, I don't shut my eyes. You don't know what will follow. You watch and pray. That's what it is. <laughs> but I did that, uh, and, and then I tell you the truth. The moment she said, Jesus, she threw away that cigarette. And she prayed that prayer of, of, of confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what she told me. She told me this. When the Bible says that there is an anointing upon someone's life, she says this, I see the anointing of God upon your face. And this is what she said, I was once a believer, but I'd walked away from God. What I did I do? I obeyed God and led that woman to the Lord. I don't know if I'll, I'll ever see her, even if now it's been 20, I think about 20 years. If I see her today, I wouldn't even recognize her. But I believe I'll see her in heaven. Why? That was obedience. Was it easy? No. 
Whatever God has called us to do is not like it's easy. But what he's asking us is to commit to him and he'll make it possible for us. That's very important to know, to know that. But listen to this. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, this is what it's going to take, church. Great commitment and faithfulness. Great commitment and faithfulness. And one of the things that I've learned so much in serving God is, is through my local church. I've learned a lot. Because that's where in you learn submission. Submission. And that's where you, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Especially through your local church, other leaders being around you, over you and all that. That's when your true submission comes in. And that's where character formation, character is formed. The people can sing, sing wonderfully, but they'll never accept one correction in their lives. I'll say right there a little bit. There are many problems that we have in our society. It's because of lack of submission. Do you know many problems we have even in marriage relationship is because of lack of submission? That people don't want to submit to each other. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm, Tina tells me I'm wrong. Well, forgive me, honey. That was never my intention to make such a mistake or to offend you. That should be just that simple. But what it is, uh, if she tells me an example, uh, you did this and I didn't like it, I say, what did I do? No, that's not what I did. That's exactly where problems began. Submission is powerfully important. Listen. Uh, let me see how I can phrase it. You'll have great peace, great peace, if your pursuit in your heart is for you to grow spiritually. And for that to happen, there has to be submission. Fast to the Lord. Fast to the Lord. And it's amazing uh, in your local church how you learn things. That's why you wonderful, you serve any area. Any area you serve. It's amazing how you, you can learn things. And you'll go out there in your workplace and your bosses can ask you that you really are different. We've had testimonies from this church, people being told by you know, their, impl- their bosses that you really are different. Your service is excellent. Why did you learn that? If you are taught the word of God, fine, and, and you do, you'll be a doer of the word, that's exactly what you happen. Listen, that's promotion. You're promoted. I have learned so many things from the years that I committed to self pastors Wade and Carl. I've learned a lot of things, and I've worked in so much favor in different places because of them. Because of them. And that's very important, church, that you have to, 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 have, you have to submit your heart first to the Lord. But your service to God in every place you go. But first begins even in the local church that you want to serve. Few amens there. I was coming to lift you up, not to, to, not to, um, to correct you. You understand? The pastor today wanted to correct us. Uh, the correction is good too, but that's not the whole purpose is for you to show you the path, the right path. Let me read to you something. This is a bit lengthy, but we have few scriptures, then we, we wind up. Few, yeah? We had a meeting yesterday. Uh, the divinely united uh, meeting, uh, leaders meeting, you know, for couples. So it's the first session, which is part of the training. So we are starting at nine o'clock. So I told Tina, my wife, that, that uh, I'm going to speak for one hour. And she looked at me, she asked me, you? I said, yeah, for one hour. If I exceed you to be at just about 15 minutes, she said, you sure of that? Yeah. I need to come back also to prepare for tomorrow. Anyway, she wasn't so sure I was going to take one hour. I took slightly an hour, I think, uh, my five minutes or so. So if I tell you a few scriptures, just be prepared. We have some few more scriptures, okay? 
All right? A few more scriptures. Let me feed you the word of God. You go home and, and just be belging. What you've learned, regurgitating it. Is that rija or regurg? I don't know what, what the right word for it. But Luke 3, 9, 23, 26. Let's read some scriptures here. Pay attention to this. And he was saying to them all, this is Jesus, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, this is what he must do first. He must deny himself. I like this one. Listen to the Amplified Version where it says, he must set aside selfish interests. Wow. He must first set aside what? Uh, deny himself, set aside selfish interests. That's what I was asking you. Why do you do what you do? Is it for recognition? It has to be my, your question and my question. What do I do what I do? I must set aside first what? Selfish interests. I said again all the things that we are seeing in this nation and never before. It's because of selfishness, self-centeredness. But he says this, you set aside selfish interest, and then he says this, take up his cross daily. Listen to this. Expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. Maybe I lost some of you now. Dying. Dying. <laughs> I remember years ago, that was late 90s. We used to, you know, we used to, to have the, the past time I, I was under, we would go putting posters around, you know, in the city. No, man, you remember the time we used to have so many posters. Do they still do that? And the city council never wanted that. So anyway, one evening we just, you know, there were posters in the evening, uh, maybe seven in the evening, and then uh, uh, we were caught by the city council Ascaris. And we were put in that lorry. <laughs> and the crusade was getting close, so we had to finish. So anyway, we went, and, and mostly, and it's not bad-mouthing them, but you'll go for licenses, and they'll take you round and round and round. So you think, like, let's put these posters around. So anyway, so we were taken in there in Kamukunji area, a friend of mine, we just sat in there. And then we started singing. And then uh, uh, those, some of those, uh, you know, Ascaris, the city council Ascaris came and said, you all think that you are Paul and Silas? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, exactly, and wait, within a short time we shall be out of this place. And people are bribing, actually. They're giving out money to, go, to, to, to leave the place, hawkers mostly. And we sang, my, bro, my friend and I just sang, and within a short time, it didn't take even long. Someone came in there and, and asked this. They were, in, I think, in the university together and said, what are you doing here? I said, they caught me doing this and this, my friend. And I said, no, they shouldn't do this. Come over here. And we are released. <laughs> Paul and Silas. <laughs> That's the attitude. It's like, whatever it takes, whatever comes, may, you are ready to suffer even uh, uh, for, for your faith. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world, listen to this, whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death, unfortunately. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake, he's the one who will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Now listen to what he's saying, the whole world there. Wealth, fame, success, and loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed here and now of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him, of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Heavenly Father and of the holy angels. So gaining, which is he's talking about gaining the whole world, it talks about wealth, it talks about fame, it talks about success. 
Be aware of these things in 1 John chapter 2, 15. It talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life. Be aware of that. Be aware of self-interest, self-centeredness. I'll give you a solution for that. Serving God first begins by this. I love him. That's why I serve him. He first loved me. But now in my life, I love him. And I will serve him. I will, I will not follow my self-interest. I will serve you, Father. I will live for you. That's a blessing. That's a peaceful life. Everything that you lose, uh, I'm, I'm, you live for the kingdom. He says this, I'll give you a hundredfold in this life. And persecutions and the life to come eternal. Brethren and sisters, it's the whole thing here. You choose in your life about serving God. Selfishness does that, is completely against God. That was the first sin that was committed, you know, we know of, of Lucifer, because he had self interest which is actual pride, the pride of life. The way I look, what people will think about me. But look at this. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, God. He looks at the heart. I want, I don't know about you, but I want my life to be approved of God. I like for him to say, well, welcome. <laughs> welcome. You did, whatever you did, you did it by faith. You did it as sent to me. You did it as unto the Lord. Why is that so? You've chosen his life. Let's, let's read a few scriptures then. A few scriptures then we wind up, okay? Praise God. Let's go to Philippians. Let me see if I can read it from the Passion Translation, Philippians chapter 2. Come on now. Talking about Jesus, remember he says you fall after his example. Look at verse 6. The Passion Translation says this. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his, as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly, servant. He became human. Think about this church. I, I, you know, for us, we are born as, you know, human beings. But think about God becoming human, leaving all the glory of heaven and coming to live on this earth. It says this, he became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. And he says this, he was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. He says, we follow him. He is lowly. And then look at verse 9. Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. God told the children of Israel exactly that. If you serve me, you will be high above all nations. So that is there. Greatness is a result of serving God. And it's not in the standard of men. Because the greatness, that what is thought of greatness by men is not greatness before God. Jesus is our great example. Now, and let's go then to Joshua 24, 13 to 15, and then we'll be winding up. Joshua 24. Joshua is coming to the end of his life. Serve the Lord. There's 110 years. 110 years. That's wonderful. I like to. 110, you're just strong and your back is straight. Praise God. 
You can hit some 10 kilometers running. Have you that in mind? You can hit. You know, you know, really, really seriously, and, and I so desire this, and I'm praying. Last, last year, we were at Mount Kilimanjaro in September. And I really desire to go several times. Most likely, we start working. I think next year, we'll be taking up a team uh, to Mount Kilimanjaro for raising the funds for, you know, our home and uh, our children's home and uh, the school we have here for vulnerable and uh, vulnerable and orphans. orphans. But I desire, most likely next year, I'll be missing that already, going to that mountain. So most likely next year I may be going back. If not, I will have people like Deacon Norman. I don't know about Deacon Yvonne. Deacon Yvonne, I'll give us some more years. If you want to go, that's... <laughs> but anyway, and the rest of you desire to go. But, but look at this. I desire to go several more times to Mount Kilimanjaro. That's my desire. I'm not saying I'll do that, but that, that's my, this is my desire. And I desire at 85, if the Lord tarries, at 85 to go back to Mount Kilimanjaro. At 85. And go up there, uh, 19,000 meters above, past 19,000 meters above sea level, and be there. And I say, Lord, you know now I'm raising funds for the elderly, the poor elderly. <laughs> it's no longer for children. Now I'm still young, so I'm raising up for children. But at 85, I'll be raising up for the poor elderly. And I, I've told Pastor Carla this, and she, she tells me, uh, Davis, maybe that you'll do when I'm in heaven. <laughs> I think mine for children. I say, I understand that. We'll do it for children. But I so desire, uh, before I go to be with the Lord, to have, like, in this ministry, we have a good home Good facilities for the poor elderly people. Wonderful. It will be with the best doctors you can think of. The best equipment you can think of. And then, and then, uh, and then the, the, the rooms, you know, just the nursing, kind of best nursing home you can think of, but we have the doctors and we have ministers, you know, to minister the word of God to these people and to prepare them into the other world, eternity. And the music continuous in the rooms, just wonderful, heavenly music. And just to see them smiling at the end of their lives, going to the eternal home. Because we'll make sure we lead everyone to the Lord. Now we'll have a section for the wealthy, people, that they can bring their parents and all that, then we can get money to help these ones who are needy and poor. You, you see what I'm saying? And then most likely then that's maybe uh, that's my last trip to Mount Kilimanjaro for the poor elderly. Will you be with me, brother? I better just come and say, I'd be there. Last time we had Holy Communion there at the top. We had Holy Communion there at uh, the peak, uh, the summit, uh, the, the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, the Uhuru Peak. And I just received all communion and said, Father, I'm doing this for the poor elderly. And, and I'm going back. And I, I believe for, uh, this is my last trip here. But thank you for giving me strength. This, is the, the, this was the attitude of Caleb. Give me this mountain. At 85, give me this mountain. Look at uh, Joshua at 110. You have to have a vision of living long and strong. Not stooping around and just forgetting everyone. No, and, and strong. <laughs> That's a wrong image of elderly people. That's never God. It, look at this. Ah. Let me look at this. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, he says this, And Moses, Moses, he did not lose his eyesight. His eyes did not grow dim, nor his natural vigor diminish. He was, he was 120 years, and he went up to the mountain, and he died. 
You know, I see what they, they, they show. I, I like the movie, you understand it. But what they show in the Ten Commandments of Moses going this way up the mountain to, take, to, to receive the, the tablets of, of the Ten Commandments, that's not true. That's not scriptural. Moses had vigor, had strength. His eyes, he didn't have even, he didn't have specs. He didn't need them. His eyes were fine. At 120, and he went. He stood right there, and he was ready to die. Now listen to this at 110. Joshua 24, verse 13 to 15. I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Listen to this. This is the whole thing about God. Every word that he says, he will fulfill it. All what he needed from the children of Israel is to serve him. He says, I have, I have given you a land. Did he not tell them I'll give you a land that flows with milk and honey? He kept every single word for them. Or to them. Every single word. I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Rest. And cities which you did not build. And you dwell in them, you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Possession. Possession. And this it says this. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him. And he says this in sincerity and in truth. And he says, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. And he says this church, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. You will know in your heart how you're supposed to serve him on a daily basis. You will know because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You will know what displeases him. You will know what fulfills him. You will know what brings him, brings him pleasure. You will know. You're a believer in Christ. He says he served the Lord. And verse 15, I'll say this. I hope I won't be saying this at 110 to some of you. He says, and if it seems evil to, serve, uh, to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves. This day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that are on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in, those, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, I hope you are agreeing with me. But as for me and my house, this is what we are going to do. We will serve the Lord. Ask me after 50 years. You don't have to ask me. You'll be seeing that. I'll serve the Lord. And I want you to do the same. I want you to be faithful. Selfish interests will not satisfy you, will not fulfill you. Serve the Lord, our God. You choose today. So as you rise up on your feet, this is your choice. You're going to do that today. Hallelujah. Please rise up on your feet right now. Did you receive anything out of this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you receive anything from this word? Yes. God has called you to serve him. God has called me to serve, you, to serve him, church. That's our decision. The healings you need, the deliverance you need. And many sicknesses and diseases we are seeing is as a result of the rebellion and, and, and every kind of uh, anxiety while you are supposed to serve them. Lift up your hands, please, and I'm, I'm going to lead you into a prayer. Just thank him for his word. Praise Him. Worship Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We, we worship You. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We thank You. We praise You, Father. Father, You sent Your Word and healed us and delivered us from all our distractions. I ask you for your grace and mercy for every disobedience, Father. There are things that in your own life you know, uh, as a child of God, you know the things that you haven't done. But there is the mercy and there is the grace of God. 
But there has to be a commitment in your heart today. You say, God, I want to serve you for the rest of my life. If this is your commitment. I want you to lift up your voice after me and say, Father in heaven. Say it, Father in heaven. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to save my life. And this prayer, by the way, if you are not born again, this prayer, right now as you make it, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Say, Father in heaven, I believe Jesus Christ came that I may serve you, that he may reveal the Father to me. And right now, I commit my life to you. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my possessions. I give you my dreams. I give you my everything. Take my life and do something with it. Thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. And Father, there's no single person that you do not know in this place by name. You know they're lying down. You know they're rising up. You know their thoughts are far off. Your word says so. Father, every covenant and decisions that have been made today, that has been made, have been made to honor you, I'm asking you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to come right upon each one of them. I take authority over every ungodly entanglement. I break that soul tie in the name of Jesus. The individual or individuals that you have been in, a, in relationships that you can tell they have weighed you down and you are so attached to those relationships and yet you know that that relationship is not leading you into service to God. So let go of that relationship. You know it's not of God. I, I release the power of God and break that soul tie in the name and godly soul tie in the name of Jesus. And Father, I release your ability upon your people. And I release faith in your ability for the joy to rise up in your people's hearts concerning their service to you. I bless them. I thank you for healings. I thank you for deliverance. I command every pain. I command sickness and disease. I command you to leave God's people now in the name of Jesus. Every kind of pain, every kind of disease, every kind of disease, I break your power in the name of Jesus. And I lose God's ability by the stripes of Jesus. You were healed and therefore you are healed now. Thank you, Father, for your peace and thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit upon the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hallelujah. Will you give him praise and glory? Thank him. Thank him. Praise. Hallelujah.